Hello, everyone. It's Tim Shriver with the uh, team from Unite, uh, our little upstart organization trying to take on the ambitious, audacious goal of constructing a pathway, uh, designing uh, a model, thinking through the implications of trying to unite our country. I'm joined today by a good friend, uh, in many, many ways, a colleague and an ally, but in other ways, an unlikely bedfellow, the a brilliant thinker, Arthur Brooks, the author of over 11 books, one of which is one of my favorites called Love Your Enemies. Um, recently, the head of the American Enterprise Institute, the conservative leaning think tank in Washington that has been the seat of much of the policy and thought leadership of the conservative wing of our country. So you would think not uh, on my side of the team, uh, but at the same time, we share so many things, uh, a conviction about the importance of the American spirit, a commitment to the deepest values of our country, a shared faith tradition, and right now, a willingness to try anything to end the culture of contempt that uh, Arthur has talked about and find new strategies for bringing our country together, reducing the anxiety and pain of this moment and seeing a more hopeful future. So welcome, Arthur, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for the work you're doing with the Call to Unite. I mean, it's incredible. The kickoff that you had, it inspired people literally all over the world. I mean, we did a, I, I did a little part of this telethon. It was like the Jerry Lewis telethon for uniting everybody. And I heard about it for weeks and you got statesmen, people from all over the world. It was a beautiful way to begin it. And this, the way that you're continuing it now, it just couldn't be better. Thank you, Arthur, and thank you for supporting it. And thank you for being willing to take a chance uh, and being, in fact, a pioneer of taking a chance on the other side. So I just want to start by asking you, you know, a lot of Americans are puzzled. We're, we're perplexed. How in God's name did we get to the point where all, over half of us feel anxious, uh, afraid, uh, divided, uh, uncertain about the future of our own lives, of our country, of the planet? How did it get this bad? You know, it's a, it's a question I've often asked, but there's a lot of research on this, believe it or not. I mean, as a, as a social scientist, it's actually incredibly interesting, even as it is frustrating and sometimes scary. And what you find is that in any human conflict, you, that, that is basically, it's, it's mostly based on a mistake. When you have implacable conflict, whether it's a marriage that's breaking up or, or war, diplomacy that's breaking down or politics like today, both sides believe that they're motivated by love, but the other side is motivated by hatred. Now that's an error because both sides can't be simultaneously motivated by love and hatred. One side is an error, usually both according to the research. And that's where we find ourselves today. But Tim, that's a big opportunity. The reason that the call to unite is, that, is the movement for the moment is because we have this entrepreneurial opportunity to solve a problem that's based on a social and, and mental error. Mm. The other side, no matter who, everybody watching us, they can think of what the other side is. You think the other side is motivated by hatred. That's wrong. The other side is motivated by fear. And what neutralizes fear? Perfect love. Perfect love drives out fear. Unity is the answer through love. So, um, you know, when we're talking to one another, you know, a lot of people will look at you and me and say, uh, I side with, uh, I'm in Arthur Brooks's camp. I believe what he believes. And some might say, well, I, I, I know Tim Shriver. He comes from a democratic family, progressive. I believe what he believes. Uh, but what you're saying in some ways is that we may actually believe the same things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, well, he, here's the deal. We believe fundamentally in the same mission but we have disagreements about how to meet that mission. And that's the way the country is supposed to be defined. See, the strength of the country is based on the truth that the competition of ideas is fundamental to a good and just and free society. If you don't have a competition of ideas, you have mediocrity. You have a, you have a society that actually can't make progress. The United States was founded on the idea that on, on the enlightenment idea that we could that we must disagree that I need personally look I'm somebody who has a lot, lot of conservative beliefs I need Tim Shriver for a bunch of reasons no, number one is 100% of the time I'm not right I want to know first when I'm wrong and I want the best arguments and furthermore I want to be surrounded by people who are going to be questioning my views 
within the context of respect. But when we, when we forget that big mission, that core around which we're supposed to just be spiraling as a nation, when we forget the core of the mission of what it means to be an American, to lift other people up, to bring them together, to be a beacon of hope in the world, then we just start focusing on the details. We start focusing on the, on the accoutrements of, of what our politics is all about. And we start thinking that we're more apart than we actually are. I mean, look, you and I will disagree on the marginal tax rate. Who cares? That's actually not that important, actually. I mean, we get down to it. If we can agree on the big thing, then let's argue about the little thing and compromise. But so, so let's be practical here. Uh, I think our country should end racism. Do you agree? I completely agree, of course. I think our country should have uh, economic mobility so that people on the bottom can move up freely and with a reasonable chance. Do you agree? Dignity and opportunity all day long. I believe that people should be free to practice their religious beliefs, but not use their religious beliefs to oppress others. Do you agree? Uh, completely. Okay. Completely. This is good. So this is where we find ourselves with common ground. Uh, even though when we get to the tactics to end or advance the goals, we may disagree. But your point is we could actually get better ideas, more creative ideas, more transformative ideas if we actually listened and worked towards common visions, values, and goals. Am I getting exactly it? right? Exactly right. And, and Tim, here's the practical implication of this, which I've actually done working with people who think they agree on nothing. You get them together, and the first thing that you do, you don't ask them to talk about taxes, you don't ask them to talk about abortions, you don't talk, ask them to talk about guns. The first thing you ask them to do is to talk about their shared loves. What do you love? And they're gonna, you know what they're gonna talk about? Their kids, and they're gonna complain mutually about their teenage children. And they're gonna talk about their churches, and they're gonna talk about their neighbors. That's what they're actually gonna do, and that's a beautiful thing, because once you talk about your shared loves, which we've already done in this short conversation, then everything else is a way that we can mutually agree or, or disagree or compromise on how we can share better those shared loves. So, so, so here's the practical thing. Last night, there was a debate. Republican and Democratic candidates won the president, won the vice president, jockeying, uh, arguing, advocating for their points of view. When you, at the end of that, uh, I'm not going to ask you who you're going to vote for. Not so much, not so important right now. Did they meet the test of the American system of, of presenting themselves with creative, transformative ideas that can lead us into the next four to six to eight to 10 years, or did they fall short? Well, the answer is yes and no for two reasons. Number one is yes, because we're actually able to have a debate you know, we're actually able to coalesce around conditions in which people there look they're they're adjudicating ideas and arguing with each other they're not basically boycotting the debate and bringing a militia that's a really good thing and you know and you know three cheers for democracy that's all i can say our our society has not melted down when people say this is worse than any place in the world and worse than any time in american history that is flat out 100% wrong we've had armed conflict in in instead of actual debate so was it a productive debate? Not very much. Were there great ideas that were actually bandied about and the possibility of compromise? Not at all. But was there a debate and was it peaceful? Yes. I'll take the victory where I can get it. Now the complaint. Was it substantive? Not really. Did it actually elucidate differences in, in, in actual ideas? No. What was the modus operandi of the debating styles? The answer was fear. Vote for the other guy? You're going to be in trouble and the country is going to be in bad shape. And you should actually, a good debate is based on the idea where I have ideas that are a better way for you to express your love for your fellow man and your love for the world. Instead, they were both saying, you should vote for me because you should be afraid of the other guy. And that's pretty unproductive. So you wrote recently, Arthur, that uh, we should tune out the media, that the more we watch and the more politically engaged we are, the more unhappy we are, the more partisan we are, the more uh, outraged we are. So we should temper our connection to the media and even to political life and get involved in being yeah. the change, I think is the way you put it. So give us the recipe. What, 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 what's the, what, what am I supposed to do? Here I am, I mean, I, COVID notwithstanding, what can average people, what can we each do 
to unite the country now if we want to get involved rather than get outraged? Yeah. So the, the, the big point that you're that you're underlining here, which is so correct, is that we've, we've got kind of an outrage industrial complex in the media. When you hate, when anybody watching us hates politically, somebody's getting rich, somebody's getting followers, somebody's getting clicks or views, somebody's profiting and it's not you. So this is a big problem where the, the complex in media is basically entertainment and actually not social change. And it makes sense. You can't actually exact very much social, enact very much social change at the federal level. You can just watch your favorite partisan news network and get angry at it. And that sort of stimulates the dopamine in your brain. But if you really want to have more happiness, you need more control. And control means you need to be able to have some levers of influence. And the only way that you can do that is a super local thing. The founders of their country wanted this to be a profoundly local country, not a national country. And at that time, Washington DC was far away and we didn't really know very much what was going on. They intended us for us to get involved. Even when the local election doesn't go your way, the studies show it doesn't create tremendous unhappiness for you because when you get involved, you actually can. How many people on November 3rd are gonna be intensely watching the presidential election and not even know who just got elected to the superintendent of schools in their neighborhood, in their community? That's a big upside down world because the superintendent of schools is gonna affect your community a lot more than the president of the United States. You know, I was on a call the other day with uh, a, mem a few members of my family. We were talking about grief and sadness. Um, and one, one, one of my uh, fellow family members said, you know, I handle that best by serving others, by getting involved. And when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, uh, if I can do something small to help someone else, it helps me recover. Yeah. And in some ways, we're all a little bit feeling down yeah. and fearful. And it sounds so old fashioned to say, help someone else in a I moment know. like this, right? It sounds so naive. We need justice. We need peace. We need transformation. We need new tax policy. We need new border policy. We need new trade policy and all that kind of stuff. We do. We need all that. But maybe the little steps, I think you're saying, maybe the small steps in the local school and your faith-based institution and shelters and the community centers, not just to give to others, but allow others to give to you, just small steps maybe uh, yeah. are, are the beginning steps of uniting our country again. Yeah, you know, that, that's so true. And, and it, it doesn't surprise me at all that that came from a family discussion. You know, I've, been, I've had the privilege of knowing your family living next door to, you know, next, literally next door to members of your family. And your parents were members of my parish in Bethesda. Your, your father, what a great man who was ded you know, dedicated his, I mean, a truly great American who dedicated his life to, to tr trying to transform communities in the nation itself toward one that is more giving. This is based on profound moral and philosophical truths, but also on very solid social science, which is what I do for a living. I mean, we see, we see that the parts of the brain illuminate when you're being magnanimous. Now, to be great souled, as Aristotle called it, it's within your grasp to be happier. Let me give you one practical thing that all of us can do on November 4th. Now, this good, is assuming good. That's what we know. I want to know. What should we yeah. do on November 4th? Okay, so, so this is assuming we know the outcome of the election. Sooner or later, we will, but let's just say it's November 4th. Let's, you know, hope <laughs> that no, Wednesday morning we know what, what the outcome of the election is. Half the country is going to be happy and half the country is going to be suffering, more or less. I mean, just, let's just say it's 50 50. We're a divided country. Tons of evidence shows that the people who are suffering are suffering more than the happy people are happy. It's a net net happiness loss is what we actually see after these elections. What can the winners do? And the answer is to make themselves happier, not by rubbing the nose in it of the people who've lost, but by being magnanimous. There's one tiny little thing that everybody who's happy on November 4th can do, which is to reach out to a family member, reach out to a neighbor who's, who's displeased with the result, who's disappointed with the result, and actually be generous in that. And to say, look, I understand because I was really upset four years ago. And I want you to know that I have a lot of support and respect for you. I know how it feels. And I'm really, really hoping that over the next four years that we will 
compromise and we'll find ways to work together. And I want you to know that no matter what happens politically, you're always my brother, my sister, and I love you. I'm making my list because I'm hoping I'm gay able to make that call, but uh, that's just me uh, dis disclosing uh, my partisan side. But it's beautiful, Arthur. It's really a beautiful invitation uh, to each of us. Uh, we, we know all the relationships that have been frayed, fractured, wounded in these times. Uh, but it would be wonderful if someone were to call me, if, if my hopes and dreams were dashed on election night and call me and say, don't worry, uh, my side won, but I'm in this with you. Uh, that would that would have made a that would make a big difference. I know yeah. to me, and I. So it's a great it's great advice. We just got a couple more minutes. I, I want to ask you, uh, bring the country back together. Right. Uh, if you were advising the president or the president elect, um, what's the first three months? What what what's 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 how do we how do we heal? Both pre both candidates have said they they're fighting for the soul of America. Right. How do we heal the soul of America after this process is over? The answer is love, not fear. So the soul of America is not a fear-based soul. And the, the reason for that is there is no human soul that can be based on fear, only on love. Love is the essence of the human soul. And love and fear are cognitive, psychological, philosophical, and theological opposites. It's not love and hate. And so that being the case, that the first thing that the, the pre next president of the United States has to do is to, is to turn 180 degrees off the current level of polarization, which is the fear-based politics, and say from here on out, it's gonna be love-based. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to agree. You know, you, you can and I president, can- Can a president say that? I'm gonna use, I'm gonna create love-based politics? Absolutely, look, it, I, absolutely a president can do that. And absolutely a president can do that. And will people mock it on Saturday Night Live? Yeah. For sure. And that's, we should, we should, we'll laugh at it and it's going to be great. We'll enjoy it. But the truth of the matter is, look, if there's, there's no major religion in history that has done good for humanity that did not talk openly about love, to talk about brotherly love, love for country, there's nothing shameful in that at all. And to say that I love my country and my politics is gonna be based on the Americans love for each other from here on out. I will not listen to somebody in my party who's using the language of fear. The only people who are welcome to give me advice, the only people who are welcome to be in the inner circle of my administration who will, who will influence me are those that will use the language of love, of inclusiveness, and to quote the call to unite the language of unity. So um, last two questions quickly. Um, is there a spiritual text or experience from your tradition that you find brings you closer to people of other traditions? How, how do we, how do, how does our faith, how do our faith-based communities help on this effort? So uh, here's uh, just a little idea that might be useful. So I, I'm a Christian like you, and you know we're a, we're in we're an apostolic faith. You know, you know it's it's uh, we're we're evangelical. We we get out and I mean we're Catholic, so we don't have that many of the of the missionaries like a lot of like the Mormons do. But but you know we're we're apostolic fundamentally. I saw a sign in, a, in, in near my old home and near your home in a place called Our Lady of Bethesda. It's a retreat center for Catholics. And, it, and when you're leaving the chapel, there's a sign over the door to go out to the parking lot that says, you're now entering mission territory. <laughs> that's what we need to remember, whether you're religious or not. That's a religious sentiment, but it's actually a fundamental se a sentiment about how we can make the world better. Everybody uh, on November 4th, no, starting right now, as soon as they finish watching this broadcast, remember, you are now entering mission territory. No matter where you go, you can touch other people with these ideas of love and unity. And in so doing, your mission will be to actually confront the contempt that we see in our culture and bathe it and neutralize it with the love that actually people want. Look, 93% of Americans hate how divided we become. That's a big entrepreneurial opportunity. So the mission though, isn't to make people join my tribe. The mission is to spread love. Did I get that right? That is correct. That is correct. And what, for what? Because your tribe fundamentally is my tribe. 
That's the point. Remember, the core mission is the same tribe. We just happen to be living in slightly different places with respect to the core. And that's not just kind of a cost of doing business. That's not a bug. That's a feature of American strength and greatness. One of my, one of my great heroes, maybe yours too, Dorothy Day, had a short expression that was captured in the title of one of her books, Little by Little. Uh, maybe, uh, Arthur, as we turn the corner as a country after this period, maybe if we each take little by little, yeah. the job of more, f more love, less fear, more connection, less judgment, uh, brothers and sisters all, even though we're in slightly different worlds, and we build not just the America of the past that we, some of us may love, but also the America that we want, that all of us can love, uh, we inch closer. What's one, um, who's one person you need to reach out to, Arthur? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I'm, and I'm trying to think, you know, I, and I've been thinking about that over the last few days. And, you know, I, I need to go through my book reviews and, <laughs> and, you know, find, find people who panned me. Um, somebody with whom I, you know, I've really borne a grudge and, you know, I'm going to, you know, the, uh, I'm going to answer that question and I'm going to do it and I'm going to make that commitment. I'd like everybody else to make that commitment too. It's not a politician because you know what? I actually have a huge amount of respect and admiration for politicians on both sides who really put it out there every single day. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to figure that one out, Tim. Okay. You so we'll, you and I will both make a pledge that somewhere on social media will post uh, at some point in the next week or two, uh, a person we're going to reach out to, to try to, extend uh, uh, a word or a connection of love and uh, reduce the amount of fear or divisiveness that may have crept into our lives. Uh, make it personal, make it national, uh, make it real above your enemies. Arthur Brooks, what a rock star. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for your work. Let's uh, stay in this together. Yeah, you got it.